Good evening, Westmobile family. Uh, we're excited to have you here for our Wednesday night Bible study again. We are going to be in the eighth chapter of Joshua tonight. We're going to continue our discussion, our kind of uh, verse by verse walk through Joshua. But before we get into that, I want to just address a couple of things with you. Uh, as most of you are aware, uh, the governor came out with um, her update for where we are with the pandemic and the quarantine. Uh, things have shifted a little bit uh, with the new Safer at Home policy for the next two weeks. But for us, uh, for churches, uh, we have not changed. Uh, we are still limited to 10 or fewer in our gatherings. We must maintain social distance. We will not be able to have any more uh, meetings um, as of right now. Uh, this is not my preferred method to communicate with my church family, but this is the best we've got for the foreseeable future. Uh, we have discussed, your staff uh, has discussed uh, several possibilities, options. Uh, we just feel like right now this is the safest, smartest, most efficient way to do it is just to continue to be online. Uh, I promise you that as soon as we can meet in a, in a reasonable amount of, with a reasonable amount of people and keep everybody safe, we're going to do that because that's what I want to do, and I know that's what a lot of you want to do. Uh, we want to emphasize, first off, to be safe. Uh, we don't want to put anybody at risk and take any unnecessary chances. Number two, I want to encourage you to continue to be the church. Just because we're not meeting under one roof does not mean that you are not the church of Jesus Christ. So continue to share the gospel, make disciples, love on each other, show the love of Christ, be the hands and feet of Christ, uh, continue to do those things. And then number three would be in our priority system here is our corporate meetings. Um, we hope that at some point in the near future we're going to be able to get up to you know, some bigger number. Uh, that's still going to really limit us as to what we can do. Uh, just to give you an example, if, if, the, if the governor had said we could have 50 in a meeting, uh, what 50? Uh, what 50 uh, of our church family are we going to let in, and how many are we, is that going to leave us uh, keeping out? Uh, so I hope, I hope you understand where I'm coming from there, that even, even with a lifted restriction of some kind, that still puts a lot of pressure on us to figure out how to make that work, uh, with also the social distancing and the sterilization of the, of the seats and the bathrooms and the doorknobs and all that kind of things. Um, we have discussed, I know several people have mentioned uh, things like uh, drive-in church. Uh, we've actually discussed that. I have walked around and looked. Uh, we have no shade <laughs> to speak of. There's really not a lot of opportunities for us here on our campus, the way we're laid out, to park and have uh, you know, a, a good area to where we can uh, mark out everybody, keep everybody safe and separate, uh, and still have a good service. And then that also really restricts how we can record. Uh, right now, as you, some of you that tried to watch our first week of live streaming with our new camera, uh, our internet here is just not sufficient to do that. So that's why we've shifted to the recordings on Saturdays. Uh, if we do an outside service, for us to be able to record it for those who can't make it to that, we would have to figure something else out. So uh, just sharing that with you to tell you that we are looking at it, we're thinking about it, we're praying through it, and we're trying to make the best decision possible for everybody. We're trying to keep from putting ourselves or you in an adverse situation health-wise or just in, in clarity of getting the word out and having a worship experience. So uh, let me encourage you to just continue to be faithful. You guys have blown me away with your giving, uh, with your uh, comments and shares and encouragement. Just continue to do that and just bear with us. I promise you we're doing the best we can. And uh, I'll tell you this, nobody wants to get everybody together again as much as me, or any more than me at least. So just bear with us as we try to work through some of these things. Um, so let's, let's, let's get ready to go into, into Joshua 8. Uh, and and I'll, you know, if you have any other questions for me, you can shoot those to me and we can discuss them and, and try to get back to you. But uh, I promise you we're doing the best we can. Uh, this is uh, some pretty unprecedented territory. Uh, your staff is working diligently and uh, they have been amazing. Um, the amount of uh, wisdom and insight that they have given, the, the questioning uh, that they have provided that have helped us think through some of these things better, uh, the research projects that we have kind of uh, sent them on. Uh, we've gathered a lot of information. We've, we've kind of gathered the data, and we reviewed it, and basically the, the, the end result is we're doing the best we can with what we have right now. And when things change, we'll, we'll look at them again. Uh, I'm hopeful that, that we're going to get to a place soon where we can open back up 
and have, you know, if we can get up to maybe 100 at a time, that's a, that's a game changer. Uh, that shifts our focus completely from what we're doing. Uh, we're going to continue to do have a, a large online presence, uh, even once we kind of get back to normal or whatever that is. But for right now, just uh, we ask you for grace. We ask you for patience. And understand that we are doing the, the absolute best thing we can do to try to pastor and shepherd you uh, and lead the church and honor the Lord in doing it. So your patience is greatly appreciated and your prayers are coveted, I promise you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, speaking of prayer, and let me pray for us and then we're going to dive into Joshua 8. Father, we love you and we thank you for your sovereignty. Uh, God, you were, you were aware of all this way before it happened. Uh, you have a plan and we want to be part of it. God, help us to be faithful. I pray that you administer to our uh, shut-ins, minister to our senior adults who, who have to be uh, very careful in this time not to contract this virus. Uh, God, for all of us that are trying to do the best we can to, to stay safe and healthy, I pray that you would help us to do that. Most of all, God, I pray that you'd help us to honor you with every decision we make, every Facebook post, every social media post. Uh, God, just help us to honor you. Uh, and God, help me to be patient. I'm not, I'm not prone to patience, so God, I pray that you'd help me to have more of that uh, as we continue to work through all this stuff, as, uh, as we trust our leaders to make the best decisions for us, but ultimately, God, we trust you supremely above anybody else, so we know that you are working all this together for our good and for your glory, and so now, God, I ask you to bless this time in your word, quicken it to our hearts and our minds, help us to take it uh, from, our, from our ears to our hearts and from our hearts to our hands so that we can serve you better in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, Joshua 8. Uh, last week we had the, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're in the uh, Aiken camp, we, we had a very rough week. Aiken had a bad end. It was not a good day for Aiken, uh, which should just again point us to the fact that God is sovereign, but, uh, and he's gracious, but he's also justice. And so he, he said, don't touch the things that are under the ban. Aiken took it upon himself to indulge his flesh rather than obey the Lord. And he and his family paid a steep price. So now what, what kicked us into the Aiken story was two weeks ago when we talked about the Battle of Ai. As a reminder for those of you that are with us, uh, as a maybe a, a, an update for those of you that weren't, uh, they had just taken Jericho, this big victory, and they looked at Ai, and it was a little podunk town just outside of Jericho, and they thought, we'll get you know a couple thousand guys, we'll go up there, we'll whip them, make quick work of them, and we'll take that over. And so they didn't consult the Lord. They didn't really pray about it. They just went off on their own, and AI whipped them and sent them running, killed 36 men, which, again, was 36 more than they lost. They didn't lose anybody when they took Jericho. So those 36 were the first 36 they lost in battle in the Promised Land. They freaked out. They panicked. They came together. They wept. Joshua kind of faltered in his faith. The Lord spoke to him and said, You've got somebody who took something from Jericho. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna honor you until you find out who that is and punish him. And so they found Achan. He admitted it. They stoned him, burned him, set up a, a monument there where he was, piled up the stones. And then the verse, uh, the last verse of that chapter seven says, the, "Then the Lord turned from his burning anger." And so that was what they were looking for. They were looking for God to turn from his burning anger, which is a good place to look if you're in the middle of God's burning anger. So let's look at verse one of chapter eight. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid or discouraged. Take the whole military force with you and go attack Ai. Look, I have handed over to you the king of Ai, his people, city, and land. Treat Ai, its king, uh, and its king as you did Jericho and its king. You may plunder its spoil and livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the city. All right, so just in those first two verses, what jumps out at me is God's encouragement, first of all. That... Um, he, he, didn't, he didn't go back into the thing with, with Achan. He didn't hash up that old stuff with uh, Joshua and say, yeah, you better watch out. You know, you did wrong. You messed up. You should have paid attention. He didn't do any of that. He just said, don't be afraid or discouraged. I think a lot of times for us, that's a great word for, for what we're going through now uh, or where we have troubles in life. You know, may, maybe, uh, maybe kind of working out some of that flesh and, and battling some of that stuff. Maybe you've gone out and done something that dishonored the Lord or, or you know, wasn't something that you know as a Christian that you should do. I, I think we could read this and say, do not be afraid or discouraged. God is a God of grace. Again, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can always go back to the Father 
There's a great song by Cody Carnes that says, I run to the Father. And, and that's what we can do when we've made mistakes, when we've, when we've dishonored the Lord, when we've gotten outside, when we've touched things under the ban, when we've you know, done like Achan and gotten our hands in the cookie jar, uh, you know, we have to pay a price, but then we can know that God is there to be faithful and just to forgive us and, for, and uh, forget our sins, forget our trespasses. So the, set, the first thing is the encouragement of God. The second thing is the impatience of Achan. If, if only Achan had just trusted God and been a little patient, didn't plan on saying what I said, you know, I don't, I don't write any notes, probably should, but I wanted to speak to you from my heart before we got started on this about what's going on with our being able to assemble. But, but patience is an important thing. Achan got impatient and he looked at these gold and silver shekels and this coat and rather than be patient and wait upon the Lord, and trust that God was going to provide him something way better than gold and silver and a pretty jacket, he took it. You know, he, he coveted it. He, he stood, uh, took it, stole it from the Lord, basically, and then went and hid it. If only he had been patient. Here God says, you may plunder it, spoil the livestock for yourselves. Jericho had everything under the ban. AI, you can plunder, uh, plunder and, and get all that stuff you want for yourselves. So if only we would be patient Take God's encouragement, be patient and wait upon the Lord, and know that he's going to provide us better than whatever it is that we think we're going to sneak out in the front part. Verse 3, so Joshua and the whole military force set out to attack Ai. Joshua selected 30,000 fighting men and sent them out at night. He commanded them, pay attention. By the way, this is a good thing for us as leaders. If you're going to give directions, you want to make sure people are listening. So Joshua, again, Learning from his mistakes, learning from the past, he said, hey, everybody listen. We're, here's the rules. Now, I would, I would be willing to bet you that everybody was paying really close attention after what had happened to Aiken, don't you think? Like everybody's looking around going, hey, um, I want to make sure that I know what the rules are so I don't end up like Aiken did. I, I, Aiken, did it, he, Aiken knew the rules, I believe, and he, and he did it anyway. But they may be thinking, hey, I don't want to get stoned and burned because I wasn't listening to the boss when he told me what the plan was. So he says, pay attention, and I'm willing to bet you they did. He says, lie in ambush behind the city, not too far from it, and all of you be ready. Then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. When they come out against us, as they did the first time, we will flee from them. They will come after us until we have drawn them away from the city, for they will say they are fleeing from us as before. While we are fleeing from them, you're to come out of the ambush and seize the city, for the Lord your God has handed it over to you. After taking the city, set it on fire, follow the Lord's command, see that you do as I have ordered you. So Joshua sent them out, and they went to the ambush site and waited between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai. But he spent that night with the troops. All right, let's pause right there real quick. They, it would have been easy for them to stay on the defensive when it came to Ai because they had just gotten their hat handed to them. You know, they went up against it, they got whipped, they tucked tail and ran. They lost 36 men. It'd be really easy for them to stay on the defensive and be skittish. But Joshua's not telling them that. He's saying, let's get on the offensive. Why can we go on the offensive? Because God says, do not be afraid and discouraged. Again, we can compare this to when we fight battles with our flesh. Sometimes we're going to battle our flesh and we're going to get our hats handed to us. We're just going to get punched in the mouth. It would be really easy for us to get very defensive and all of a sudden let the flesh become this, this monster that we are scared of rather than us going to war with the flesh because we are warring against the flesh, but we're doing it in the spirit. What God is telling us here is don't be afraid or discouraged when you lose a battle because Christ has already won the war. So don't be afraid or discouraged. Go on the offensive. Get a plan. Listen to the Lord, study the scripture, study the word, be in prayer, know what God's calling you to do, and then dead gum do it. Don't, don't sit around and mope and cry because you didn't win the last battle. Don't sit around and think about the glory days when we, when we won Jericho. Today is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. That means we need to be on the offensive. When it comes to sharing the gospel, when it comes to making disciples, when it comes to living in obedience to Christ... Be offensive. Don't be so defensive and so skittish and timid. Be, be on the offense because God has given us victory. I love the quote. I've said it a thousand times. 
We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory because Christ has given us the victory. Then look at verse 8. Follow the Lord's command. See that you do as I have ordered you. If you want to be in good graces with the boss, you do what the boss tells you. When I, when I used to teach at Ransom, I haven't done that in a while, a couple, a few months now. I miss it. I miss those ladies. But I used to tell them there are two kind of employees that every boss hates. The ones who won't do what they're told and the ones who will only do what they're told. I think our requirement for follow, as followers of Christ is to know the word so deeply that we don't have to be wait, sitting around waiting to get a direct order. Hey, hey, Kevin, go tell that person about me. No, we know the word so deeply that we know that's our, that's our marching order. That's our call. We're going to go ahead and share the gospel with him. We're going to go ahead and be on the offensive rather than be defensive and sit back and say, well, why didn't you tell him about Jesus? Well, the Lord didn't tell me to. I was sitting around waiting for an angel to come tell me to go share the gospel with him, and I didn't never hear. Or we sit there and we think, I'm going to be... I'm going to be so timid and so scared because I've lost this battle with the flesh that I'm not going to get outside of what I'm comfortable with. I'm not yet going to go that extra mile and put myself out there to share the gospel. Whatever it is, you've got to, you've got to know the Lord's commands so that you can follow the Lord's commands. That's right. You can never do something if you don't know what it is you're supposed to do. So rather than just be somebody that comes to church and runs around like a chicken with your head cut off, how about come to church, soak up the wisdom of, from teachers and from leaders and mentors and disciple makers, and then go out and live that out. We're not supposed to be like uh, bottles that we, we, you pour all this into us and we just store it up and put the lid on it. We're supposed to be sponges that we soak it up and then we go out there and we let it pour out of us by, by sharing Jesus and making disciples. And then look at the last thing on verse 9, and, and we're probably not going to get through this whole chapter. We don't know. Um, I know all of most of you, my college students, are shocked that we may not get through a whole chapter. Um, look at the last part of verse 9. It says, but he spent that night with the troops. Man, I love Joshua. That is, that Joshua is my guy. You know, he, he, he knows where they are. He knows what they are thinking because of this, this beating they took and this embarrassment they took from Ai. So he doesn't just tell them to go. He goes with them. He spends the night with the troops out there, and he's probably he's probably rallying the troops and trying to encourage them and getting them ready for the next day. That's a leader. I love to read these stories about how Joshua led by example. Then look at verse 10. Joshua started early the next morning and mobilized them. Then he and the elders of Israel led the troops up to Ai. All those who were with him went up and approached the city, arriving opposite Ai and camped to the north, with a valley in between them and the city. Now Joshua had taken about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. The military force was stationed this way, the main camp to the north of the city and its rear guard to the west of the city. And that night Joshua went into the valley. When the king of Ai saw the Israelites, uh, the men of the city hurried out and went out early in the morning so that he and all his people could engage Israel in battle at a suitable place facing the plain of the Jordan. Just pause. I'm sorry. I, I just I read this and, I, and, I, and the way my brain works. The king of Ai is probably feeling himself. You know, he's like, hey, you know, those Israelites took Jericho, but we sent those Israelites packing. You know, they, they tore down Jericho, but they hadn't seen Ai. We're Ai. We're Ai. You know, they got a little chant going, Ai, Ai, which is a crazy chant. But so I, I could just picture him. That's why he went out early in the morning. He said, hey, I'm going to go get, I'm going to go with me some Israelites today. I'm going to go get me some more. Of this, I'm gonna go. You know, uh, again, I'm making my tale great. When when they tell the story of the great king of Ai, they're gonna include all these victories over the Israelites that took out Jericho, that crossed the Red Sea, that crossed the Jordan. So he he's probably thinking, I'm gonna pad my resume today by whipping up on these Israelites again. Then look at what it says in verse 15. Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten back by them and fled toward the wilderness. Then all the troops of Ai were summoned to pursue them, and they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. Watch. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel, leaving the city exposed while they pursued Israel. There's a lot here. I'm just, I'm just going to say this. When you run out to battle and you're not really prepared and you're not thinking, that's a dangerous place to be. They ran out in the flesh. They ran out in this like wanderlust of 
you know, we had this big victory and we're kind of feeling full of ourselves and we're kind of reading our own press clippings. You know, hey, what? Well, my mom was right. I am special. Look at what we did to Israel. And they just ran out without any hesitation, without any forethought, without any just concern for what they were leaving behind. They only believed what their, what their, what their eyes saw. They didn't think through, maybe this is a trap. If they don't have that big eye thing from Star Wars to tell them, it, it, you know, right, some of y'all got that. So they just took off and they left and left the whole city unguarded. Verse 18, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Hold out the sword in your hand toward Ai, for I will hand the city over to you. That word sword there, some of you probably have a translation that says javelin. Uh, the point of this is that sometimes God requires us to put in effort. Now think about this. This whole time, remember Moses holding his arms up and he had to have Aaron and Hur helping him hold his arms up because they got so heavy, but when his arms dropped, they started to lose. When his arms were up, they were winning. This is the same kind of thing. God's like, hey, I'm on your side, but I want to know that you're bought into this. So hey, Joshua, hey, leader, hey, leaders, listen to me. Sometimes it's on us. Sometimes it's on us. I've got one sitting right here running the camera for me. Hey, buddy, sometimes it's on you. Sometimes God tells you, leader, hold out that sword. Hold out that javelin. The, the point of this is it was a heavy thing to hold out. It wasn't like he was just holding out a, a postcard. He was holding out a sword, a javelin, whatever it was. It was heavy, and he's holding it out. So Joshua held out his sword toward Ai, toward it. When he held out his hand, the men in ambush rose quickly from their position. They ran, entered the city, captured it, and immediately set it on fire. Some translations there, there say they quickly set it on fire. I wrote this in the little margin here. When you learn a hard lesson, it makes you click to obedience a lot faster. They immediately set fire to the city. You know why they immediately set fire to the city? Well, look at me. They didn't want another Achan to get their grubby paws into some spoils, cross over whatever the Lord... They didn't want any, any possibility of somebody getting outside the dots and bringing a curse back on Israel like Achan did. They didn't want their... Any, any time we have a God calling us to do something, you have two options, instant obedience or disobedience. They were instantly obedient. They took it, they captured it, and they burned it because that's what they were told to do. You can go back and look, and he tells them, verse 8, after taking the city, set it on fire. Yes, Lord. <laughs> yes. We don't want to be back in the situation we were in before, so we're going to do it immediately. Look at verse 20. The men of Ai turned to look back, and smoke from the city was rising to the sky. This was that moment that, like I picture, um, you know, they look back, and it's like this uh-oh moment where they all look around and go, anybody remember when Carl Lewis sang the national anthem? You know, Carl Lewis is a great track runner, a great athlete. Somebody should have vetted the singing a little bit better. He starts to sing, and he gets, he can't hit this, the first high note, he misses it. He can't hit it, and he goes, uh-oh. This is that moment where they're running out and going, ah, then we're going to go kill the Israelites. Ah, and they're all screaming. They're all happy. And then they, they get out there. They're chasing them. And then they, somebody looks back and says, hey, did somebody leave someone on the stove? Hey, there's, there's a bunch of smoke coming back from home. And this is that moment where I think it starts to, like, that moment of, uh-oh, fear, hesitation, whatever starts to seep in. They could not escape in any direction. And the troops who had fled to the wilderness now became the pursuers. When Joshua and all Israel saw that the men in ambush had captured the city and that smoke was rising from it, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. The men in the ambush came out of the city against them, and the men of Ai were trapped between some Israelite forces, some on the side, I'm sorry, some on one side and some on the other. They struck them down until no survivor or fugitive remained, but they captured the king of Ai alive and brought him out to Joshua. Then, when, excuse me, when Israel had finished killing everyone living in Ai who had pursued them into the open country. And when every last one of them had fallen by the sword, <clears throat> all Israel returned to Ai and struck it down with the sword. The total of those who fell that day, both men and women, was 12,000, all the people of Ai. Joshua did not draw back his hand that was holding the sword until all the inhabitants of Ai were completely destroyed. Israel plundered only the cattle and spoil of that city for themselves, Watch, according to the Lord's command that he had given Joshua. Look at three times in this, in this passage, three times in this chapter. God gives a command, they did it, and then they sort of reaffirmed it here. Joshua is making sure to say, 
In verse 2, this is what the Lord said. In verse 8, this is what the Lord said. And then you see in verse uh, 19, they did it quickly. And then in verse 27, they, they did handle the spoil properly. Verse 28, Joshua burned Ai and left it a permanent ruin, desolate to this day. In other words, that's the writing of this documentation of this event. He hung the body of the king of Ai on a tree until evening. And at sunset, Joshua commanded that they take his body down from the tree. They threw it down at the entrance of the city gate and put a large pile of rocks over it, which remains to this day. Again, not, not today, but then. Now, remember, I know a lot of you are probably looking at this going, man, God is mean. You know, he's just nasty. He, he's vengeful. He's, he's wrathful. He's a, he's a God of war. No. Well, he killed 12,000 people, you know, the whole city. Yeah. But go back and look. We've read this before, but I'm going to read it again. But Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 6, and Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. I'll we'll say that again. Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 6, Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. Those are the places where God says, hey, all those people in that land, basically here's what it says. They are beyond, you know, they're, they're not going to come back. They're beyond revolting. They're an abomination. They're evil. Again, you got to remember, these, these are the people who were throwing their kids, their children, their babies into a fire to worship this fire god, Molech. They were, they were idolaters and, and, and pagans, and God said, they're irredeemable. Wipe them out. I mean, remember now, this is a purpose. God has a purpose in the children of Israel being a pure children of Israel, a pure lineage all the way down, back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob so that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, could be born of a virgin, to be in this position from this heritage. This is all part of the plan, so it was important that he made them follow through with it, okay? Okay. So don't, don't look at the fact that God wiped them out. Look at the fact that they were an abomination. They were not going to come to Christ. They were not going to come to Christ. They were not going to put their faith in Jehovah, in Yahweh, because God knows from the end, from the beginning. He knew what they were going to do. And, and I know this is not popular, but just parenthetically, I'm just going to say this because it's true. The clay has no right to tell the potter what's right and wrong. Right. I'm just going to say that. The potter is the potter, and he can do whatever he wants to with the clay. If I made this coffee cup, I can break this coffee cup, and nobody can tell me that it's wrong because I made it, and that's what God can do. We have to put our trust that he knows enough. He's good, he's sovereign, he's holy, he's righteous, but he's also justice. So we know that if he did it, he had a reason to do it. That's, that's good enough for me. All right, verse 30. We may finish. Oh, hold on. At that time, Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal, to the Lord, the God of Israel, just as Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded the Israelites. He built it according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool has been used. Then they offered burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed off fellowship offerings on it. There on the stones, Joshua copied the law of Moses, which he had written in the presence of the Israelites. This is just a reminder of God's promises and a reminder of God's rules. They've, they've, they've had a big victory. They had a big failure. They had to do justice inside of their camp, which was not pretty, not pleasant for anybody. And now they've had another victory, and everybody was obedient. And so Joshua's using this time to call people's attention. Hey, I'm going to write the law of Moses. I'm going to copy it out on here so we can see it, be reminded of the goodness of God, but also the wrath of God, the, the righteousness of God that requires us to follow his rules. Verse 33, all Israel, foreigner and citizen alike, with the elders, officers, and judges, stood on either side of the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, facing the Levitical priest who carried it. As Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded earlier, half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim and half in front of Mount Ebal, to bless the people of Israel. Afterwards, Joshua read aloud all the words of the law, the blessings, as well as the curses, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of it that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read before the entire assembly of Israel, including the women, little children, and foreigners who were with him. All right, two things here real quick. I love that verse 35. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua didn't read before the entire assembly of Israel, including the women, little children, and foreigners who were with him. So in other words, he didn't just read it to the fighting men. He didn't just read it to the leaders. He didn't just read it to the, the kind of the higher echelon. of, of the, No, he read it to everybody. Women, children, foreigners, everybody that was involved. Hey, you're all part of this. You're all part of this body. You're all part of this tribe, this nation of Israel. 
Here is the here is the law of the Lord, and he read it to them, so they couldn't be, they couldn't plead ignorance. They couldn't say, "Well, I've never heard it before. I don't remember." He read it all, and and watch this. The second thing is, he didn't just focus on the easy stuff, the encouraging stuff, the the oh that makes me feel good, that makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. No, he read the stuff that cut them to the core too. He read the difficult stuff. He read the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's what we have to understand when we study God's Word. We don't study God's Word to just be encouraged. We don't get our sprinkle of Jesus just to make us feel good about ourselves. We don't just read the verses out of the Psalms that say God loves us and has a wonderful plan for our lives. We also look at the justice of God. We look at the holy anger of God, the righteous wrath of God. But here's the beautiful thing about it. We're going to close with this. That righteous anger, that, that, that wrath of God, that was put in a cup. And that cup was drank by my Jesus on Calvary. I don't have to worry about being a person of AI because I'm a person of Jesus. I don't have to worry about being aching because I'm going to be obedient. What I've got to worry about is that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What I've got to worry about is the great commandment to love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love others as myself and the great commission to go therefore and make disciples. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded because I am with you even until the end of the age. Church, we're going through tough days. I love the old expression, tough times don't laugh, last, tough people do. I encourage you to hang in there. Be faithful. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. Be encouraged. Study the scripture and know that our God is righteous and holy and sovereign and our God saves. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for this uh, chance we have to just dig into your beautiful word. God, I pray you would just make it come alive to us. I pray you would help us have a, a mind that could retain it. I pray, God, your, your word tells us in, in Psalm 119, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I pray we would all take that to heart. I pray we would spend some time during this uh, quarantine period. Uh, God, stop worrying about how long it's going to last and start worrying about learning what you're trying to teach us. God, I pray that you would encourage your church I pray you would call the lost, and I pray you would help us to serve you better. Thank you for your word. I pray that it would, it would move mountains tonight in somebody's life, that it would, it would challenge and change somebody tonight for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you.